One of my favorite topics, automatic flushing. Automatic flushing has been around for probably 12, 15 years now. Uh, it's pretty mainstream technology to help improve and maintain water quality and distribution systems. Uh, this is a presentation I put together, I do at conferences, I think it's called the dead end danger zone. Usually the worst water quality in a distribution system is usually your dead ends uh, because dead ends do not loop. So depending on how many houses or connections you have on the line and how often that line is turning over, this is usually where you have some of your worst water. Now my experience has been when working with distribution superintendents is that let's say I have 100 dead ends in my system. Um, if I have 100 dead ends in my system, most of the time on average, 85% of those or 85 dead ends are probably okay. Short cul-de-sacs, a lot of houses on the line, they turn the line over on a regular basis. And usually about 10 to 15% of those lines are the ones I have to deal with. So know that even though if you might have 400 or 500 dead ends in your system, it doesn't mean every single one of your dead ends is a bad dead end. I have some tools we'll talk about today that helps you figure out where your bad dead ends are. Uh, and when you do figure out where the bad dead ends are, then you know where to point your gun. And we have some tools that help you, like automatic flushers, help to turn those lines on a regular basis in order to keep your, uh, uh, your water, your chlorine residuals up, make sure your water quality is good. So let's jump in and talk about the dead end danger zone. So what does water, what does age have to do with water quality? I've been in the business now for over 10 years. And I remember when I first came on, I'm thinking, what's, you know, what's the big deal with water? Why do they flush? hydrants and things, you know, water's water. Uh, it doesn't go stale like uh, Coke and it doesn't uh, go bad like beer. Um, so what's the deal with water? And the, the deal is this, Uncir uncirculating water and distribution dead ends can pose a serious health problem for consumers. As uncirculating water ages, disinfection residuals decline while at the same time disinfection byproducts increase, both of which can create consumer health issues for distribution and water quality managers. Basically, when we add chlorine to water, we chemically change that water. And when it's changed and that water ages, bad things happen. And that's what we'll talk about today is aging chlorinated water, aging potable water. So the first dead end danger zone is falling disinfectant residuals. Now I know I have some folks on the line here from Canada and in, in Canada, you can't fall below a 0.2 ppm. Uh, or else you have to call the water ministry and you know do all the stuff uh, and public notices so on and so forth. So up in Canada, they've had this rule for quite a while that all the systems need to stay above a 0.2 ppm. We're starting to see that now in some of the states down here in the United States, Pennsylvania, and the other state was uh, Illinois, uh, have both uh, imposed new rules where they need to maintain a 0.2 minimum residual throughout their distribution system. Uh, and they have to take samples to comply and so on and so forth. So this is something we'll probably start seeing to spread in the U.S. as well, where they're going to hold compliance for a 0.2 ppm. So when we add chlorine to water, uh, just like in a swimming pool, chlorine dissipates over time. Now, if you're using a free chlorine, which the, the vast majority of systems I come across use a free chlorine, free chlorine usually stays in the system pretty steady for about the first 200 hours or about a week. Um, after about a week, it, it drops off very quickly. So about the first 200 hours or about a week, it stays pretty steady. And then after that, the, the dissipation rate is about 1.5 ppm per week. So it drops off very quickly after that initial week. If you're using a combined chlorine or a chloramines, which allow the larger cities or the larger rural water districts to use, uh, it's about half that rate. So it'll stay in the water a lot, about twice as long as the uh, free chlorine a couple of weeks, but then after that, the dissipation rate is about a 0.625 per week after that. So usually it's a longer dissipation for the combined or, or than the free chlorine, the combined or chloramines and the free chlorine. So from these charts, I know it's hard to see on the video here, but it shows the, the, the uh, dissipation rate for free chlorine and chloramines. Most states in the U.S. Um, require at least a 0.2 ppm for residuals like Canada. There are a few exceptions. It's done state by state. Uh, there are some states that have higher residuals based on issues that they might be dealing with locally in their systems. So once the residual falls below the minimum level, that 0.2 ppm, the chlorine is not strong enough to penetrate the cell walls of microbials and destroy them from the inside out. So that's why it's important to maintain 
those 0.2 residuals in your system so that you, that you can maintain control of microbials and make sure that you're not having any type of microbial activity in your, in your system. Um, of course, you know, you test for total coliforms. If someone drinks water with total coliforms, they're not gonna get sick or, or die, but there's worse things out there like fecal coliform and of course E. coli, cryptosporidium, so on and so forth, okay? The second thing we deal with when we add chlorine to water and it ages is this thing called disinfection byproducts. And this is what most lay people don't know anything about. I didn't know anything about disinfection byproducts before I got into this industry. I tell all my friends and family, I've learned everything I didn't want to learn about drinking water. Uh, and this is one of the things that I learned that I didn't know. Although chlorine, a disinfectant, helps to eliminate and control the growth and spread of microbial pathogens, it carries a side effect. A good way to kind of uh, make sense of this is if you watch TV. If you watch TV at night, you know that about every other commercial is a drug commercial. And these drug commercials I, I find so interesting because everybody's you know, outside and enjoying a picnic and everyone's smiling and they're telling you how wonderful the drug is and what it's gonna do for you and so on and so forth. And then they get to the second half of the commercial and they tell you about all the side effects and everybody's still smiling and having the picnic and everything's great. It's like chlorine. Chlorine is a drug that makes water safe to drink, but there is a side effect. And that side effect is, is when chlorine comes into contact with naturally occurring organic material that's in all water, no matter if it comes from the ground or a river or a reservoir, when it comes into contact with those organic materials, it, it transforms them into, into toxins that we call disinfection byproducts, trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids. And when consumed, or even in the shower when the mist, we breathe in the mist and so on and so forth, when they're consumed, they can cause such issues as heart disease, liver damage, um, nervous system uh, activity damage. And then there's even a link that the University of Illinois was doing a couple of years back about the link between disinfection byproducts and Alzheimer's disease. The EPA has known about DBPs since about the late 70s. And thus we've had our stage one and now our stage two disinfection byproduct rule in which you have to take your quarterly samples to submit to make sure you're staying under the levels that the EPA prescribed for disinfections, which are the following. Now, the interesting thing about disinfection byproducts is they begin to form in about four to seven days. So as soon as the water, the chlorine hits the water in the plant, that's when the clock starts. It goes in the tank, it goes out in the distribution system. So it's about a four to seven day contact time before these things start to form. So I like to use a good yardstick of about a week for water quality. If my water on a dead end main is less than a week old, I'm probably okay. My residuals are probably all right. And I'm not having any, dis having any disinfection byproduct uh, activity. It's when you start getting beyond a week that we start seeing the, the uh, residual starting to drop off and also the rise of these disinfection byproducts. So I like to use a good yardstick of about four to seven days or about a week. So if my water's less than a week old, hey, I'm probably golden. If it's more than a week, those are the dead ends that we need to try and focus on. And I'll show you some neat tools that we have here that help you figure that out. Now, there's a lot of different things you can do to improve water quality, tank turnover strategies, source water treatment, so on and so forth. One of the easiest ways to uh, mitigate uh, poor water quality on dead ends is flushing. It's simple, it's easy, it doesn't cost a lot. You don't have to flush a lot of water, uh, especially if you're using things like automatic flushers. They don't flush a lot of water, they just turn lines over on a regular basis to make sure that your residuals stay very steady and my disinfection byproducts don't form. I get that old water out before the DBPs start to form in the water. So flushing is a very easy, best method in order to maintain water quality, especially on dead end mains. Now, some tools that we have for you that can help, and I forgot to grab one of the paper ones. Can you grab them up there? Um, I forgot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have some tools that, and I, and I developed these tools because I would go to distribution systems um, and I would ask the superintendent, I'd say, how many dead ends do you have? And oh my gosh, we got 630 dead ends in our system and I only got myself and three guys on staff. And I, when I asked them if they flush lines, they say they try to, but they never get to more than maybe 15, 20, 25% of the lines every year because there's other things that go on and flushing's not a high priority unless Mrs. Brown calls down on Main Street and says that her water tastes bad, looks bad, smells bad, and then you go flush the line. 
So I developed some tools that help you figure out where your dead end problems are. And they're based on a calculator that pretty much um, says that if I know how big my pipe is and how long my dead end is, I know how much water, I can calculate how much water is in the line, okay? So if I know how long the line is and how large the pipe is, I can calculate the amount of water in the pipe. In the US, on average, most households use about 350 gallons of water a day, okay? Now, if I'm out west, it's about half of that. Arizona, California, Colorado, any, anything really west of Colorado, Colorado and west, they use about half of that. But most of the rest of the US, we use about 350 gallons of water a day, washing clothes, washing dishes, taking showers, cooking, cleaning, drinking, so on and so forth. So if I know how many houses are in a line, and I know how big the pipe is, and I know how long the pipe is, I can calculate on an average of 350 service connections a day, how many days on average it takes these amount of houses on this line to turn the pipe over. And if it's less than seven days, it's a situation where I don't need to worry about um, uh, flushing the line because my houses are turning the line for me. But if I'm on one of these lines that is taking more than seven days, for the um, uh, houses to turn the line, then this is one where I might want to put an automatic flusher on to turn the line. Basically, an automatic flusher acts like another house or more houses on the line that just turn the pipe over within a week's period of time to make sure that you're getting old water out and bringing new water in. So this is uh, a copy of the paper version of this. And if you want a copy of this, you have my email. I'm happy to send as many as you like. And the way it's set up is every page is uh, a pipe size. So down here, there's tabs that say, uh, four inch pipe, six inch pipe, so on and so forth. So this is a six inch pipe uh, uh, guide here. Along this axis is the number of service connections, up to 35. So I have the number of service connections, and then along the top, I have the number of uh, the, the length of the pipe. How long is the pipe? Up to five miles long by tenths of a mile. So if I know the pipe is 2.1 two miles long, and I have 10 houses on here, I can go down here and I can look to see what number is in this uh, corresponding cell. And if it's larger than four, then we usually recommend doing a automatic flusher. And the reason why I picked the number four is because I like to, to compensate for a couple of days that the water sits in the tank before it gets out into the distribution system. So like I said, once the chlorine hits the water, the clock starts, you might have one or two days of tank turnover time by the time it gets out to the dead end and you're looking at uh, these, these numbers here. Uh, it gives you an idea. So if I'm in the green section, that's the section that I probably want to put an automatic flusher on the line. When I'm in the blue section, I'm having the, the lines turn over for me. So if you like a copy of this, uh, we have this available. We're happy to send them out to you. It's just a quick little guide. You can have it in your truck. You can have it at your desk. That's a quick way to see if particular dead ends are um, problems or not. We have the same type of calculator right here on this electronic version that you can download from our website under our resource center, our website's hydrants.com. Very easy to remember, hydrants.com. And when you download that, you'll just fill in the yellow boxes that are on the calculator. How, how big is my pipe, how long is my pipe, and how many houses do I have on the line? And they'll calculate how many days it takes those houses to turn the line. The other piece of information I'll ask is what your tank turnover time is. How often do you turn over tanks? One day, two days, so on and so forth. If you put three days in on your tank turnover time, it's going to add three days to the total so you'll know what you have. At the bottom of that calculator in red, if you have a dead end where you're not turning the line over within less than seven days, it'll actually give you a, a recommended flush time where you can program your handheld controller on your uh, uh, automatic flushing station so that you're, you're programming it to flush the line. It'll tell you you should flush this line 12 minutes a day. And you don't necessarily have to flush the line 12 minutes a day, but I can aggregate that over two or three times a week. I might flush Monday, Wednesday, Friday at two o'clock in the morning for 30 minutes, wherever it might be. The nice thing about automatic flushers is that I can program them to go off when I want them. And a lot of people do it in the, in the early morning hours between two and 4 a.m. Because that's your lowest demand time when nobody's out walking their dog and nobody sees any water, no one hears any activity. So it's a good time to do these in the middle of the night. People wake up the next day, fresh pipe of water, everybody's happy. They're brushing their teeth, they're taking the showers, they're making breakfast, so on and so forth. So on this electric calculator, I do have another thing that we can do as well, and I've done this for a couple of cities. Um, this is the same spreadsheet, but instead of doing a one-off or just one dead end, if you have the information in your system about your dead ends, 
pipe size, length of dead ends, number of service connections, and you want to share that information with us here at Cupferly, you can send that to me. And what I'll do is I'll list all your dead ends in a sheet that looks like this. I'll color code them by age so that you can see what the bad dead ends are and what the not so bad dead ends are. A good example of this is I did this for a city down in Texas uh, a little while back. They had 136 dead ends in a certain part of their distribution system. They had water quality issues, but they, you know, the superintendent said, I can't afford 136 automatic clusters. And I told him, you probably didn't need 136 automatic clusters. Why don't you send me the data and I'll do the calculator for you and I'll send it back to you. So I did the calculator for him, sent it back. He had 21 really bad dead ends. But again, 80, 85% of his dead ends were the green section. So he didn't have to worry about those. So they did wind up purchasing about 21 automatic flushers for these particular dead ends. Their water quality improved. Everybody's happy. He didn't have to spend a kajillion dollars on 136 automatic flushers. We figured out where the problem was, and then we addressed the problems that he had. So I can, as a free, I can do this for you. If you want to send me the information, I'm happy to do it for you. I'll send you the data, and then you can do whatever you want with the information that I send. Okay? One other tool that we have that's very effective, and it's kind of a neat tool, is this thing that we do some products that we call intelligent monitoring and flushing stations. So this one down here is actually a portable monitoring and flushing technology. It's an analytical tool. I attach it to a fire hydrant, and I can program it to maintain a certain residual or turbidity, so on and so forth, uh, system. So the way it works is I put it on there, I turn on the hydrant, and I tell the station that has a PLC and a chlorine sensor in the station. So I tell the PLC, I want to maintain a 1.0 minimum residual and a 1.5 desired level, and I want to sample the water twice a day, at noon and at midnight. And at noon, the device turns on, it flushes some water to get some water flowing. The flow cell opens up, it gets some water flowing in the flow cell. It takes the sample, it measures what the chlorine is, if it's below the 1.0 that I want, it'll flush the exact amount of water until it hits 1.5, but it captures all the data. And it actually has an RV50 wireless gateway transmitter in the station, and it'll transmit that data right to your phone or your laptop or a SCADA system, wherever you want that data to go. I can have up to eight sensors in this. So we can do chlorine, pH, PSI, temperature, turbidity, ORP, a number of different sensors. So this is really an analytical tool. I can move around my system and leave it in different spots to collect water quality data to see what's going on. And then based on the data, I might put an automatic flusher on this dead end. I might put a booster station in this particular part of my distribution system, whatever the data guides me to do. So this is a monitoring and flushing station that's a tool that helps you um, see where you have water quality issues in different parts of your area. And then uh, automatic flushers might help you in that regard. So we have a number of different easy tools for you and then these really high-tech tools as well that can help you figure out where your problem dead ends are and then we have the, the products that help to address this. All right there's three different types of flushing and today we're going to talk about automatic flushing but there's conventional flushing. I open up a fire hydrant, I open up a blow off. There's intelligent flushing like this portable one I talked about. We have a whole series of nine or ten products in that product line so if you have more interest in that I can send you some more information. We actually have a, um, a webinar on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash 1857 And you can watch the webinar on the intelligent flushers if you like. But today we're gonna to talk about automatic flushers. So automatic flushers can be used for periodic or continuous flushing generally on distribution system dead ends. The advantages of implementing automatic flushers includes, they maintain consistent disinfection residuals and steadily remove disinfection byproducts from the system by flushing less water more often. The EPA actually did a bench test on these automatic flushers compared to fire hydrant flushing, and they found that you flush half as much water when you use an automatic flusher. Because what we do with the automatic flushers, instead of doing the big dump like you do when you open up a fire hydrant, I flush less water, but more often. So like I said, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 2.30 in the morning, I'm gonna flush for 30 minutes. And at 2.30 in the morning, the valve opens, and at three o'clock, the valve closes. So I do short shots of water to turn the line without doing a big dump of water uh, that you do with the fire hydrant. So that's one advantage. Another one is you can, like I said, you can program these in off-peak hours. I can have it go off at two o'clock in the morning. I don't have to send someone out there to open up the hydrant during the day. This will actually flush the line for me in the middle of the night. Uh, labor and water costs are really greatly reduced. You flush less water, 
cost-wise, I'm not sending someone out there with a truck to turn on the hydrant and stand there for 45 minutes to an hour or whatever it might be to flush the line. Uh, and these have been approved by the EPA as a water conservation device under the Green Project Reserve Funding Program that was started under the Obama administration some years back. So they bench tested these and saw these as a good way to save water um, uh, compared to, to fire hydrant flush. So let's jump in and look at some of these. We have portable versions. Now all the versions that I show you today, we have a two inch version and a one inch version available. Most people use two inch versions. And here's a good guideline on what size you should use on, what's, on what line. If I have a six inch pipe or higher, usually the two inch works best. If I have a four, three or two inch pipe, which a lot of rural systems have, then the one inch usually works better. And the reason why is when I put a two inch flusher on a two inch line, Sometimes the pole can be a little bit too strong and you have some water hammer issues. These are designed with the diaphragm valve, so they're, they're designed to open and close slowly. But again, you wanna have the right size valve on the right size pipe. So six inches or more, usually a two inch works great. Four, three or two inch pipes, a one inch great. And we're gonna talk mostly about two inch ones today. So this is the portable version called the 9700. These are designed to flush dead ends, but the nice thing is, is that they're portable so I can move them around my system where I need them. So it just, just doesn't stay in one spot. So a number of cities, there's a large city in Iowa that probably has about 70 of these in their system, and they rotate them around all through the spring, summer, and fall. So I can move these where I want to move them and put them where I need, need to have them, okay? So it attaches to a fire hydrant, two and a half inch MST. They're portable, easy to program, they run on nine volt batteries. You change the batteries in the spring when you take them out, they'll run the entire season for you when you bring them in in the winter time. This has the valve above the ground attached to the hydrant. So these you need to bring in during the winter freezing times because the valve will crack and freeze. But the spring, summer and fall are usually the times that you flush the most. The water goes through a diffuser in the bottom of the box, flushes to the ground, or we have some other tools where you can divert the water in a certain direction. And I'll show you that here in a minute, okay? The adjustable valve does up to 200 gallons per minute. So on the face of the valve, there's a little butterfly dial here and I can actually adjust the flow. 20 gallons a minute is the minimum, 200 gallons a minute is the maximum. And here's our handheld controller. So you just program it a daytime duration, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two o'clock in the morning for 45 minutes. And it'll just follow that schedule that you set up, okay? Very easy to use. Really, the only maintenance you do on these is you change a battery once a year. So it's very simple, very simple to use, okay? Uh, some of the accessories that we have with these, like I said, we have a diverter here. The diverter can tap into the bottom of the valve and you can spray the water out away from the, from the hydrant area. So if you wanna spray it out to the curb or whatever, you can do it to the side, you can do it to the front. We have dechlor baskets that fit in here. So if you wanna dechlorinate, uh, you put in your, uh, your dechlor tablets and the water flushes through your tablets as it's leaving uh, the box. We also have a standard feature of a collar lock. So when it's on the two and a half NST, this locks around the swivel so no one tries to take it off the hydrant. We can also put uh, uh, sample bibs inside the station so you can take hand samples and see what your chlorine residual levels are. And if you wanna actually meter your water, we have a stand that we make that can go in here and locks all in place and you can have your hydrant meter and then you can have your flusher attached to the meter stand uh, as you see in this picture here. So there are some options for you to use uh, some other accessories that come along with this, okay? This is the portable version. If you are looking to get more of a permanent solution, we have two different other types of stations. This one's called the 9400 series. We have a cold version and we have a warm version of this, height, uh, of this uh, automatic flusher. The cold climate version is the 9400 and it looks like this. Uh, the water flushes inside the enclosure. This is kind of a cutaway. The water would come out of these T's and it would come down to the bottom of the, of the enclosure and it just diffuses onto a black plate right into the ground. So this discharges water above grade. Uses the same valve, same controller as the portable, a lot of the same advantages of the portable flushers, they all use the same valve and same controller. This one is just one that's set up to flush you around. And the reason is, is we have the, um, the valve is below the frost line. So here's your ground level where the black plate is. 
I have a valve below the frost line, I have a spring-loaded drain. So this drains the ground just like a fire hydrant. It's a spring-loaded drain, so when the hydrant's flushing, when the automatic flusher is flushing, it closes the spring and keeps it from eroding into the ground. And then when the flushing stops, the spring opens up the drain and it drains the ground like a fire hydrant. So these can go year round because my valve is now below the frost line. A lot of rural systems use this particular one because it drains into the grass. So if you have areas where the dead end is in a grassy area that it doesn't matter uh, where the water goes and it just diffuses into the grass, that's great. If you're flushing near sidewalks or streets or more in developed areas, I'll show you a different model that you can take a look at here. This is what the spec looks like for this one. So again, it's just a two inch tap from the bottom, two inch tap, and then it just discharges to ground. Lockable, you can lock it up so no one can get into it. And then the warm climate version is the same idea, but with warm climate, when you live in warm climate land, it's very easy because they don't have to worry about freezing. The valve is above the ground. So you can see here, the whole assembly is not below the grade, it's above the grade and it flushes exactly the same way as a cold version inside the enclosure, but all of your uh, working uh, tools and parts are above and you have a wet barrel going up to the valve from here. The nice thing about both of these stations or all of our stations is that all of them can be maintained from above ground. If you have any type of uh, uh, rock that gets caught in your valve or sticker, anything like that, you can actually take the uh, cold climate uh, for, without digging, you can pull all the guts up out of the ground and clean out your valve. And the same thing with here, it's just a quick disconnect. I take it apart, I take it in the shop, clean out my valve, put it back on and I'm ready to go. So the spec on that one looks like this. Again, same idea where I just have a two inch connection and it goes right into the station itself. Now, if you're in a situation where you are flushing in an area where you have streets and sidewalks. Again, we have another version. This is called the 9800 series. And this one flushes below grade. So this one doesn't flush the ground, it flushes below grade. So let's take a look at the 9800 for cold climates. As you can see here in the picture, the valve again, like the 9400 is below grade with the spring loaded drain. So it will drain to ground like a fire hydrant. But instead of flushing to the ground, this one actually flushes up inside the enclosure and into a six inch pipe that I discharge, usually to a sanitary or storm sewer, culvert, a drainage ditch, sometimes to a French drain, wherever I can send the water to below grade. So people will hear the water inside the box, but they don't see any water. Uh, most, of the, most of the water utilities about Colorado West, this is the one they use, because out in the West, they don't like to see water running down the street, or everybody goes crazy. So this is the way they can flush your systems without having any water actually being shown in the environment. People don't know where the water is going, it's all doing it below grade. We have the air gap here between the flushing outlet and the pipe, which meets the backflow uh, AWWA requirements, so you don't have any backflow issues. So again, very easy to use, installs two inch connection again, uh, and then the discharge to a six inch pipe. Um, the warm climate, same idea, but again, instead, our valve is above the ground instead of below the grade, like the warm, like the cold climates are. So just like the 9400 WC, the warm climate version, the valve, everything's above grade and I have a wet barrel, but same discharge. So if we look at the spec on this one, it's basically the same thing, except all my valves and things are up inside the enclosure, not below the ground, and it discharges below grade just like the other one as well, okay? Another new feature we have that we started this year is we have a Bluetooth option. So we have the handheld controllers or the standard that come with your automatic flushers. But if you'd rather do a Bluetooth, Bluetooth option, we have that as well. The advantage to the Bluetooth option is now your telephone or whatever device you wanna use uh, becomes your controller. And I can program everything on my phone. Uh, I don't have to actually open up the box or the enclosure to do anything. I can be 40 feet away and I can reprogram my, my controller. So if it's a rainy or a cold day, I can pull my pickup truck up near where the, the um, uh, automatic flusher is and I can reprogram or do anything I want from inside the truck. Uh, so a Bluetooth is an option that you can get with your new flushers and we can retrofit any existing automatic flushers that you might have with this Bluetooth option so that you can have your phone now as your controller instead of the controller that comes with it. 
we'll stop here for questions and then we'll do a show and tell here on a couple of reportable ones here before we go forward. Chris, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay, let's jump into a stop sharing mode here. And I'm going to make mine bigger. Here we go. In the back behind here, I have a couple of our portable devices. So if you've never done automatic flushing before, this is the one I'd recommend that you start with, only because it's very easy, okay? It's a portable device that fits onto a two and a half inch NST connection. So the nice thing about these is, is you can try one out uh, without having to tap or dig the main. In fact, we offer, a couple of offers a 30 day pilot on these portable units. So you can try one out and no obligation. If you love it after end of 30 days, whoever your favorite waterworks distributor is, we'll be happy to send you the bill. And if you don't like it, we just send UPS by and we pick it up. So if you wanna try automatic flushing and you've never done automatic flushing, this is a great way to try automatic flushing without really making any commitment for dollars at all, okay? So again, very easy to, to use. Uh, we have our, our two inch rail, let this control literature. We have our handheld controller, runs on two nine volt batteries, one's a backup. And then we have our valve with our solenoid operated. So it's a solenoid operated diaphragm valve, opens and closes slowly. Um, I can control the flow by the flow meter here. This is the one inch version. Uh, the collar lock is standard. When you buy one of these, the collar lock comes with it so you can lock it onto the hydrant. So this is a great way to try automatic flushers. And I, when I come across folks who have never done automatic flushing, I always recommend, let's do a pilot, try it out. If you like it, great. If you don't, no big deal. We can pick it up. Since these are portable, they're very easy to ship out and get back if we need to. So if you're interested in the pilot, let me know. Uh, uh, Robert G at hydrants.com, Robert G at hydrants, shoot me an email and I will be happy to set you up with the pilot before we even ship the unit. You'll know what your cost is, everything's up front. And then if you decide to keep it, you know exactly how much it's gonna cost. And if you don't, we just pick it up, okay? So these are the same controllers, same valves for this unit we use in our permanent stations like the 9400 and the 9800 series. Again, it's an easy technology to use, uh, but it's very effective in keeping residuals very steady and then removing water on a regular basis before your disinfection byproducts start to form. I've traveled all over the US and Canada, Australia, different places. I haven't met a water company yet that was overstaffed. Uh, if you're one of these that has a limited staff, flushing is usually very low down on the list. You get to it when you get to it. These, this is the type of simple technology that can really make it easy for you to, um, to turn those dead end lines where you know you have problems uh, without having to use manpower to actually go out and do that, okay? Does anybody have any questions? If you don't have any questions, then we'll go ahead and say thank you very much for joining us today. I hope that was interesting and helpful. We'll have this posted to our YouTube channel. So if you know anyone else who would like to see this in the future, our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash cupfully1857. Uh, and we'll have this posted up so you can, uh, you can take a look at this in the future as well. So with uh, no further ado, thanks for your time. Um, and we'll see you hopefully on the road sometime this year uh, with our real van visits. We're doing a virtual one today, but hopefully we'll see you on a real van visit, hopefully later on this year. So thanks so much for your time today, and I'm going to go ahead and end the session.